Sunday to Tuesday, and here we are. Of course, our, our missionary gatherings over in the coffee house have been tremendous. Thank you this evening, David. Um, as a shepherd that cares for his people, it comes through in every word that you say. Thank you for sharing your heart, talking about, of course, life in the gospel ministry, just as Hode did last night. A day in the life of a pastor. I think you're very busy. You need to slow down. No, it's a work and a passion that comes from a calling from the Lord. And the Lord truly has supplied and will supply it always for every one of you. And I thank you for your determination, dedication, and commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Great Commission, to what we just heard these two sing about. Hey, I'm going to go for a little while. And while I'm gone, before I get back, tell everybody about me. Fill the pots with some water. Let me change those lives into a brand new life and bring communion with the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great message again in the coffee house. Great message last night. Everybody get out of their bunkers yet? You cannot stop the bombs with pillows. That's all I got out of that. And don't be dumb. So I'm going to have Huli come up here in a moment. All of you that have one of these, please lift them up in the air. Would you please just show me you got that? Show me, show me you got it. Show me you got it. If you don't have it, that's all right. Because when you find it, when you get home, look in the sheet, I mean the, uh, the panel that's on the inside. So if you have your trifold and you open it up, this is instruction time. Always wanting to be a little bit of a teacher anyway. You see on the inside panel over here the list of missionaries. I'm mentioning this and I will. Uh, here and again, once in a while, now and then, those are the missionaries that your giving and your offerings support. And in that list, you say, well, how much and what's involved and all that. How about you just look at those names and Consider in covenant with the Lord that you will pray for all of them, starting at this Acts 1-8 conference all the way through to the end of next year. These are the missionaries that First Bible Baptist Church supports. These are the missionaries that we support together. And on that list, and in that list, is Good News in Action, tied together, of course, with uh, Metro America, 020, Vida Nueva, El Salvador, Colombia, Mexico City, Honduras, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Guatemala. Each one of those is a church plant out of El Salvador and Vida Nueva. Your church, maybe you know this, maybe some of you don't, you support each one of those churches every month for $300 each. We are seriously involved. A good way to let somebody know if you really are committed to them is put your monies from God where your mouth is and where your feet go. And so that's what we do together. And they are, without a doubt, one of the most important mission works that we support, along with our focus, and of course, is Zambia, Africa. Of course, there's missionaries that we support in many, many places all over the world, but that has been a stronger focus over the last 11 years uh, since I became the lead pastor, and I believe that's what God would have us to do. And I thank you for partnering, for being part of it, to say, okay, pastor, if that's where we're headed, and that's what we're doing then let's do it. And your missions pastor is completely in on that as well. And whatever we would have, whatever God would have us to do, we are in to do that. And so we're very thankful. Tomorrow evening you'll hear from uh, an intern uh, by the name of Maddox. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from Maddox, who spent a number of weeks in Honduras this summer. And uh, we've already heard the truth from Jose, so anything that you say now... You just can't sneak it by. We know the truth. But we're looking forward to that as well. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Julio, it is your time. Please come and give us the word. Well, good evening. Um, we're going to go back to the Old Testament tonight. So if you... Would please turn your Bibles to Second Chronicles, chapter two, and we're going to talk about church. 
and you might think church is not in the Old Testament. And you think about, you think church is not in the Old Testament, you are right. Church is not in the Old Testament. But the picture of the church is in the Old Testament. So let me talk a little bit about the church that we've been talking about, the church of Antioch. A church as unique as Antioch's is not easy to build. It's easy to talk about. It's easy to preach about. It's easy to dream about. But it's not easy to build. It is not easy to be a part of a church like that. Because it's costly. Being a part of a church like that requires a cost that is very high. So we're going to try to understand tonight that if we, remember last night, I said, what if? What if? What if we follow God's guidance? Because chief, chief, you, you know David, we call him chief, chief. We should send him to Kansas City, the chiefs. Right. We will never send him to Kansas City, okay? <laughs> I was just joking, okay? But Chief taught us on following God's guidance. If we follow God's guidance, we will be building a church like Antioch's. But what would it cost? What would it require? I'm going to try to answer that question from the Old Testament. And, and I, think, I think we can find a picture that might give us an idea. But just let me say that the cost is very high. Uh, we just need the right builders. And the right builders will have to pay the cost. They must be willing to pay the cost. Now, the cost is money. Yes, he just, Brownie just talked about money, but, but I'm not going to talk about money. At least, I'm not just going to talk about money. There's m many more costs than just money when it comes, comes to talking about, uh, talking about cost. One of the things that I've seen through the years, and, and, and every time I come to the States, I used to say this, and I think I, I said it once here. Uh, I've been to this church several times. And now I say it to groups when they come to, to El Salvador or they come to Metro America. But now I say it to, I say it to people in Latin America because it's, it, happens, it, it is happening everywhere. Uh, I see people that are trapped into this wheel of, uh, you know, the everyday routine, you know, uh, just going through the motions. And, and, and what I find is that mo the most common mistake among Christians is the absence of purpose in using the blessings that God gives us. We have God's blessings. And I don't mean just money. I mean, I mean everything. I mean, I mean uh, a family and, and health. And a house, and uh, uh, sometimes we have a job, and uh, uh, we have, you know, we have uh, amusements. We have a lot of things, but we don't. We just don't use those things the way we should use it. And we go through the motions, you know. We, we, you, you know how it is. You get up in the morning, and you go to work, and you make the money, uh, so you can have the money to pay for the house. So you can have a place to rest at night. So you have the strength to get up in the morning, to go to work, to, to, to have, the, you know, to have the, the dollars to pay for the house, to get up in the morning, you know, to, to have the strength to go to the work, to your job, to, to have the money to pay for the house. You know, you know how the, the, the wheel goes, you know. You know how it is. You know how, years go by. Years go by. Just Just... Just forever. And, and 25 years later, you're, you're in that wheel. And you trick yourself. We trick ourselves. 
So we say, we, we do that, we do this because of our kids. We do this for our kids. Why? So our kids can have a good education. For what? So they can, they can get a good job, so they can have the money to pay for the house, to, to rest in, at night. So they, it's, it's like a wheel. Uh, we, we, you know, I, I, I showed you last night our two grand dogs. But we don't have, we, we only have one dog at, in our house, just one dog. Uh, it lasted us for 18 years, 18 years. It was a, it was a long lasting dog. Uh, you ever watch that movie, uh, that, that show uh, Highlander? It was one of those, you know, movies. That it, <laughs> she wouldn't die. But we did have a hamster. We had a hamster. We, one, of, one of my kids, he wanted to, she wanted to have a hamster. We had a Russian hamster. And Russian hamsters live only 13, 13 months. Well, that's all they live. You know, and, and if you ever had a hamster, you know how they go. They're night animals. They sleep all day long, but they're alive at night. And what they do is they, they get up on a wheel. If you have a, you know, you know how they go. They get up on a wheel, and I could hear the hamster all night long. <laughs> my, ha my hamster, he had a name, Kiki. Kiki Contreras, that was his name, that was his name. <laughs> one night, one night, Patty and I showed up. We were, we were coming back from, from discipleship, doing discipleship, and my oldest daughter, shop, you know, she comes she comes to the door and she says, she says, this is what she says, Dad, the rat died. <laughs> and we had a funeral. And the rat died. But you know what? That's what's going to happen to all of us. We are on a wheel. And uh, a lot of us are wasting our lives. Well, what I want to show you tonight is we, we talked about getting out of the bunker last night. I want you to get off the wheel because sometimes we are in the wrong wheel. Uh, l l let me take you to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Uh, uh, let me answer the question. What is building God's house going to take us? What is going to cost us? It's going to take us three things. Three words. Three words. I think it's three simple words. Second Chronicles. You know, you know what this is. This is a picture of the church because it's, it's the story of the building of the temple of God. This is the time when, when Solomon decides to build the temple of God. He's, he's preparing to build the house of God. And he's going to, he's going to say, I'm going to build the house of God. This is, this is what he says. You, you, you recall what it is. If you, you, you know the, the Bible story, uh, David, the father, he wanted to build God's house. You recall what, what it was. Uh, God said, no, you cannot build the, the house of God. You cannot do it. You've, you've shed too much, too much blood. You, your son is going to do it. So David, the father, he collected all the money. He collected all the, all the goods. He, he put all the wood together. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then when Solomon gets on the throne, he one day he says, Second Chronicles chapter 2, verse 1, he says, And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for his kingdom. So, first thing you need to take, you, you need, that, that will take us. It will take clarity from us. That's number one. We, we need to be clear. A life without a clear purpose is a real waste. But a life without God as our top purpose is the worst of all waste. He says, I have a purpose. P 
Purpose number one is building God's house. It's not the only purpose. Because I'm going to build a house for me too. That's what he says. I'm going to build two things, he says. I'm going to build God's house and I'm going to build a house for me. You know what he's saying? He's, he's, just, he's not saying, I am only going to build a house for God. If you read it, you read it right. He says, I'm going to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house, he says, for his kingdom. And he's writing, he's building a house for himself there. It's, it's interesting. You have to answer the question of what. You know, every vision has to answer that question. What? What do you want? In a, in a while, we're going to answer another question. The other question is going to be, when? But you have to answer that question. What do you want? If you're going to get off the wheel, you have to answer the question, what? Do you, what do you want? Uh, last night, I told you about the cause. The cause is God's glory. Uh, it's, it's first. 1 Kings 8, 59 and 60. I, I read it last night, and let me read it again, because I think it's, this might be the most important verse in the Bible. It might be. It says, let my, this my words, where what I have made supplication before the Lord, be night unto the Lord our God day and night, that he maintain the cause of his servant. The cause, the cause, the reason why we're here, and the cause of his people Israel at all times. As the matter shall require, that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is none else. That is the cause. So he says, I'm going to build a house for the cause. The, the, the temple is not the cause. Listen. The church is not the cause. The church is not the cause. The church, the house of God, is for the cause. So sometimes we, we get it wrong. We, we think ministry is the cause. Ministry is not the cause. Ministry is for the cause. Anything you build, anything you build for God is not the cause. Uh, even, even you say, uh, you know, you know, I'm not going to be, a, uh, I'm not going to be building a, a church, I'm going to be building a, a, a family. Okay, that shouldn't be the cause. You should be building a family for God. He should be the, the cause. His glory should be the cause. So, so Solomon has it, has it right. Now, he's going to be building something that is big. When we, when we think about the temple, I don't know what you have in, in mind. But let, let, me, let me put up a what they think it was the temple. Uh, it was big. It was big. Th this, is, this is what the temple was. When, when they did the whole thing. I mean, the, all the atriums and everything. It was humongous. It took him seven years to build it. And it was, when you read the amount of time and people that was involved in, reading, in, in building it, it was, it was unbelievable. Uh, and it's like building the house of God today. The equivalent to building the temple of God in the Old Testament is building the church of God today. This is what the Bible says in the New Testament. It says, but if I tarry long, that thou mayst know, that thou mayst know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is, what is the house of, church of God today? What, what does the Bible say? What is the house of God today? The church of the living God. The pillar and ground of the truth. How do we build the house of God today? How do we build the house of God today? That's a question. Uh, do we build the house of God with uh, sheetrock and and brick and mortar, mortar and cement. You, you, let, let me tell you a little bit about our church. We have a church in San Salvador. We, we, have, we started our church uh, 32 years ago. Uh, 
we started in, in our living room. It was 12 people. It, it was like, like uh, David was sharing a while ago. We took our furniture. It, it was in my house. We moved our living room, and we set up chairs, and we started filling the, 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 uh, the water pots, exactly. Uh, little jars, big jars, and just, you know, sharing Jesus. And uh, we didn't have a, a, a place. We didn't have a place. And then we rented a small house down the road. And then we started trying to, to find a place. I mean, finding a place, finding a place in a, in a, in a city like San Salvador. San Salvador is very, very small, very, very little. Every time I come to the States and people ask me, what do you want to bring? I always say the same thing, you know. Is there something you want to take home? I always say the same thing. Yes, land, land. <laughs> Can I take some land? You know, uh, I mean, because yeah, everything in San Salvador is, 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 I mean, if you've ever been down there, you live by the inches. I mean, it's, everything is uh, squeezed, you know. So everything is expensive. And uh, we're trying to, you know, find land. And uh, even today, we, we have a, we, we finally decided to go multi-campus because we couldn't find a place that was big enough. They wouldn't let us build. We, we, we finally purchased land, and it's been, it's been unbelievable. So people say, uh, have you been able to build a church? That, a lot of people ask us, have, have you been able to build a church? And I always think the same thing. We've been building a church for a long time because you don't build a church with mortar and cement and bricks. You know how we build the church? You know how we build the church? You also, as lively stones, are built up as a spiritual house. You know how we build the church? With people. It's people. We are bricks and stones. Look at the person next to you. Look at the person next to you. Doesn't he or she look like a rock? <laughs> uh -huh. That's where we are. You, you know how, how we do? We chisel stone, stones. That's called discipleship. And we're building, we're building a church. Everything that is related to building the church is enclosed in, in, in the picture of the temple. We build the church. The typology is unbelievable. It says a, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to God by Jesus Christ. We are all building something in life. And if you're not clear about what you want to do for God, the other construction projects of your life will completely consume your, consume your time and your energy. So clarity. If this church is going to follow God's guidance, it will take clarity. Or you will stay on your wheel. We can talk a lot about following God's guidance. Or we can stay on a wheel. Clarity is number one. But there's a, another thing. It will take commitment. Knowing what to do is not enough. You have to, you have to make a commitment. Uh, to me, it's, it's unbelievable what happen, happens next. He says, Solomon says, I'm going to get my act together. Uh, this, there are two expressions here that I'm going, to, I'm going to put together. Set your house in order and get your act together. And that's what he did. Look at what it says. And Solomon told out three score and 10,000 men, that's 70,000 men, to bear burdens. And four score thousand, that's 80,000, 
to hew in the mountain, and 3,600 to oversee them. That is 153,600 people to build a temple. 153,600 people. That is a lot of people. You know what he says? He says, I'm in business. I'm going to build this place. I'm not just talking about it. I'm committed. I'm really committed. Uh, I'm determined. He's going to go through, through three different areas. Uh, setting the house in order is taking the mess that we have lived in and intentionally determining that no hindrances to the kingdom are left unsolved. This is, this is what it's going to take. This is what it's going to take. Let's say, let's say, let's say this church really believes we ought to follow God's guidance. Really, really. We, we, we're ready to, to, to step into the next cycle of the church, and we mean business. You know, we, we really want to see God at work. We, we don't want to be just, you know, just like another church. And, and let, let me say so, something here. I don't want to sound, I don't, I don't want to sound, uh, I, I sound mean at all. But sometimes, I, don't you have the feeling sometimes that, that, that you can actually be comfortable in living in, in a kind of a mediocre Christianity? And, and there's a need to step out of it? Getting off the wheel? Okay, if you want to do that, it, it takes clarity and it takes commitment. So you, you got to do something. He said, and he says, he says, I'm in business. If it takes 153,000 people, I'm going to do it. He says, I'm going to do it. And he sets all these people apart. He says, I'm, I'm going to do it. He, 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 the way he does it. Is, is very interesting because I think we can get a bunch of uh, we can get a bunch of of uh, principles here. Uh, a bigger principles is discipline. Discipline is crucial. You know, a- anything and everything that has to do with with Christianity takes goes through discipline. Uh, Hebrews twelve eleven. Now no chastening, no discipline, for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. Isn't it, isn't it true? Isn't it, is that the way it is? Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exer- exercised thereby. Of course, nobody wants to be disciplined. Nobody likes discipline. Well, maybe you do, but most people don't. I certainly do not. You know what everybody wants? You know what? Yeah, somebody told me a long time ago, what every, every woman wants. I said, what, what does every woman want? I said, diamonds? No. I said, traveling around the world? No. I said, what does every woman want? At least Latin woman, okay? <laughs> so don't stone me, okay? Uh, I said, what? And, and uh, it, it, this was a friend of my, uh, of my wife. She says, what every woman wants is... Eat and not gain weight. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, okay. Because that's, you know, everybody would like to have, you know, no discipline. We all wish that. But that doesn't work. He says, I will discipline myself. How? He goes into three areas. Time, talent, and treasure. He said, I'll do three things. 
I will discipline myself and I will commit time, talent, and treasures. He says, he says, look what he says. He says, I will, first of all, I will rearrange my time. I will put all of these people to work so we can finish this place in seven years. It took him seven years putting 150,000 people to work. But it took him seven years. It says, where do we know that it was seven years? First Kings 6, it says, in the four years was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid in the month Ziph. And in the 11th year, in the month Bull, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof and according to all the fashion of it. So was he, so was he seven years in building it. It took him seven years. 150,000, over 150,000 people, seven years. It takes time. It takes time. Uh, if you, if you really are really committed, it's going to take time. Let me break that into something we can swallow, because numbers don't lie. 153,600 men, if they work, this is not, this is before unions, okay? Okay. <laughs> this is before unions. If, if they worked 10 hours a day, Six days a week, 50 weeks a year, two weeks vacation, okay? Seven years, that's 3.2 billion men hours. 3.2 billion men hours to build a temple. That is a lot of time. You know what, it, if, if one person if one person had built that house, one person, it would have taken him 366,000 years. One person. Now you understand why we need teams. Teams. There's no way, there's no way somebody's going to, you know, accomplish God's work all by himself. You know, when somebody says, I'm going to be God's choice, choice servant, you know, I'm going to accomplish his, uh, I, I guess God is laughing, like, who? What do you mean you're going to do, you're going to accomplish what? Yeah, yeah I'm going to do my part of the shoveling, okay? Great, you know. How long is it going to take? 366,000 years. Time. You're going to have to commit time. A lot of time. But not only time. Look, look what it says. Not only time. It took, it took the right people. He, he says, uh, verse 3, And Solomon sent to Huram, the king of Tyre, saying, As thou didst deal with David, my father, and didst send him set setters to build him a house, to dwell therein, even so deal with him. He says, I'm going to go and find the right guys that can bring the talent to do the right work. So, so if we're going to do this the right way, we need the talented people. But, but let, me, let me say one thing here. The talent is here tonight. The talent is here. Either developed or potentially here. But it's here tonight. God's spirit is here tonight. And God's spirit is in us. Y you might be thinking, I'm not a preacher. That's okay. God doesn't need a lot of preachers. As a matter of fact, you know, you know the first time God's spirit came down to fill a person? You know who he came down to fill? You remember who he came down to feel the first time he came down? The Spirit, the Spirit of God? A prophet? A preacher? A missionary? We, 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 I mean, we uplift missionaries. Missionaries are the greatest on earth, right? I mean, it's like top. If you're a missionary, I mean, you've made it. 
close to heaven. If you're not, not a missionary, a Sunday school teacher, who, who was the first person filled with God's spirit? Uh, it's not here, but it's here. Exodus. Come to Exodus. Okay. I'm going to, I thought I was not going to take you away from Exodus 31. You know who he was? An artist. An artist? Yeah. And all musicians say, Amen. <laughs> and the Lord spake unto Moses. This is chapter 31. Saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, Uri the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled with him the Spirit of God. This is the first time. First time in the whole Bible. In wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. The guy is, he, he is a tailor. That's what he's going to make. He's going to be making dresses. And he says, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting stones, to set them and in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. And he's going to be doing all dresses and all, all, the, all everything that's going to be, you know, carpentry and all that. So God is not going to be working with preachers only. He's going to be working with everyone. So you think, I'm not a preacher. That's okay. Talents over here. You will need to use your talents. Or you will need to be trained. Commitment. And then, money. You will need to rearrange your money. Uh, I don't know if you noticed this. If you go back with me to Second Chronicle. But a large part of those 150,000 people, they were trying to cut wood. They were there to cut wood. But it says, it says that when he talks to Huram, he says to Huram, bring wood. Verse 3 says, and Solomon sent to Huram, the king of Tyre, saying, As thou did deal with David, my father, and did send him cedars to be in a house to dwell therein, even so deal with me. He says, bring more wood. Why? Why did he get more wood if he had wood? More wood? Why? The reason is this. Uh, Hurem's wood was better, was the best wood ever. He wanted to give God the best. He didn't want to give God what was left over. You know what he was saying? If I have to pay for what I'm going to give God, that's okay. If I have to take from my money, to be what I'm going to give God, that's okay. But, but Solomon, you have wood. Yeah, but I want to give him the best. You, but you're going to have to pay for that wood. That's okay. It's for God. And I'm committed. It takes commitment. Uh, he gave him 20 cities of land. For that wood. Uh, he was, I think he learned that from his, his father. Remember what, what his father said? When he bought the, the piece for the, for the temple? The king said unto Arauna, when, when he was going to get that piece of land for free, he said, nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God, of that which doth cost me nothing. Because I'm committed. 
If I have to pay, I'll, have, I'll pay. And I'll do it glad, gladly. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. So you will need to arrange how you spend your money. It takes clarity. It takes commitment. Setting the house in order is taking the clutter out of your time, talents, and treasures and deciding to use them for the right cause. It's getting off the wheel. Getting off the wheel. Clarity, commitment. But you know why most people don't do it? What I'm saying is, is, is very simple. It's not, it's not uh, I'm pretty sure I haven't said anything that is new. But most Christians don't do it. Most Christians don't do it. Most churches don't do it. Most churches go with the flow. Most churches build bunkers. And most Christians, most Christians stay on the wheel. Why? Why? And this is my belief. And I'm going to prove it to you from the next two verses. I believe most Christians don't have convictions. There's one conviction that is not present. There's one conviction that is not present. That conviction is what Solomon says. Verse 4, he says, Behold, I build a house to the name of the Lord my God, to dedicate it to him, and to burn before him sweet incense, and for the continual shoe bread, and for the burnt offering morning and evening, and on the Sabbaths, on the new moons, and on the solemn feast of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to, the, to Israel. And the house which I built is great, for great is our God above all gods. But who is able to build him a house, seeing the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain him? Who am I, who am I then that I should build him a house, save only to burn sacrifice before him? What a conviction. What a conviction. The, the difference between a, a believer who wants to do something spiritual and one who truly does it arises from the conviction that there is nothing and no one more worthy than God. That's what he's saying. He says, I'm building a house because God is worthy. I'm, I'm committed, I'm totally committed. I'm putting all this money, I'm putting all this, all this manpower, I'm bringing all these people from everywhere, I'm, I'm just, I'm building this humongous place for God because He's worthy. I'm getting off the wheel because He's worthy. He says, the house is great because God is great. And he says something else. Even my best is not enough. Uh, that's a tremendous statement. That's a tremendous statement. You, you, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of uh, humility. So, you, know, you know, sometimes, sometimes, and, and, and you've gone through that, through that uh, motion is welcome to the club. You know, the flesh, the flesh is, is awful. The flesh is terrible. Uh, if you have ever feel pride, uh, join the club, okay? Pride is awful. I, even if you're very spiritual, pride is awful. It has happened to me. It's happened to me. It happened to me once. And then I got over and I'm humble now. That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. I've, I've told people, i told people, you, you know, this is the way pride works. This is the way pride works. I preach, I preach, 
And I, I, I try to be with, with God and, you know, study my Bible and do my job and, and get ready. And, and I preach. And I get off the pulpit. And I'm praying. And I think, oh, God, God, thank you, thank you. I think that was right. And I'm proud. I feel pride. And then I think, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm proud. I'm sorry. I, I repent. And then I think, I'm so humble. <laughs> that's the way, that's the way flesh works. That's the way flesh works. And I, you know, I'm just, I'm just this, I'm, uh, this is just me giving Brownie's testimony. No, 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 no. <laughs> This is just me giving, it, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. So pride is awful. Pride is awful. But this is the way it works. We do something for God, and we believe we've done something great. And, God, and, and Solomon is saying, who am I? What is, I mean, I've done this. I've accomplished this temple, which is one of the seven wonders of the world. You know, it's, it's taken 3.2 billion men hours to build. It's got all this gold. It's unbelievable. But how can a man believe that he can build something that will contain God's glory? How can somebody even start to think that is enough? He has something that we might have lost. I told you last night, we might have lost our fear of God. But I think there's something else we might have lost. I think we might have lost our sense of awe. First Chronicles, this, this is David, Solomon's father. He says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. And thou art exalted as head above all. That, <sighs> I think we've lost it. You know how it is. Language creates culture. Language creates culture. That's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a fact of life. English is tricky. I'll tell you because I'm still learning English. You guys have some words. Awesome. Awesome. You guys say a number, hamburger is awesome. A football play is awesome. Really? God is awesome. But we don't, we don't have a sense of awe. We don't have the conviction. Solomon had the conviction. He got off the wheel. In the New Testament, the church of Antioch, the guys in the church of Antioch, they got off the wheel. Because they had those three things. They had clarity. When God called them, they were, they, they had clarity. He was very clear for them what God wanted, wanted them to do. They were committed.
move. And they move. And they had strong convictions about God. When Paul was in, in, in Miletus, talking to the elders of Ephesus, he made a statement. Because somebody says, oh, you're going to go to prison, and you know, you're going to die, and all that. He says in Acts 20, 24, None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. I have strong convictions. I have counted the cost, the cost, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He understood that nothing we give to God will ever be too much. He was like, like Solomon. He was exactly like Solomon. He understood that a life without a clear purpose is a real waste, but a life without God as a tough purpose is the worst of all wastes. Church, builders with clarity, commitment, and convictions are rare. Th this is, if, if my life was over tonight, and I hope it's not, but if my life was over tonight, this is, uh, I would say, I would, I would get up to the Lord, I would say, hey, there was not a whole lot of people like that. But I've seen that when they follow God's guidance, they can change a church, they can change a city, and they can change a culture. I've seen it happen. Truly. The question tonight is, and, and before you say yes, before you say yes, because this is not something out of emotion, Do we want to be a church like that? Do we really want to be a church like that? Will you be one of the church builders, one of those builders? Count the cost. Count the cost. Uh, God wants you to be. That's that's for sure. But one of the things is God always allows us to make our decisions. So pray about it. Pray about it. Oh. Some of us have been for so long on that wheel that we're attached to it. And it's just the idea of getting off the wheel is fearful. You know. It's fearful. Oh, but what if, what if I get off the wheel? You know? it's, what's going to happen? Don't, don't worry. God is in command. God is, God is in control. But if he is telling you to make a difference, you will make it until you actually have clarity, build a house, top priority, for his glory, the church. Not, the church is not priority. God's God's. Glory is his priority. It's, it's your priority. Build a house. Commitment. Time. Talents. Treasures. And you say, no, I don't want to do it. Okay. That's okay. Keep on the wheel. Keep on being on the wheel. It's your decision. And convictions. 
Let's pray. Brownie, will you pray?